welcome back. Uh, <clears throat> just a bit of context here. Uh, so this video is part of the uh, uh, playlist called Anatomy of Campus Fabric right on the channel. And uh, in this video, we are basically discussing uh, uh, the LISP and the VXLAN, the overlay protocols, uh, which are very much needed for a campus fabric, right? Um, and uh, just a quick check, what we have done till now is we have configured the underlay ISIS protocol and we have also done the macro segmentation which is uh, creating the VRFs right in our campus fabric. We have created the sales VRF, the IT VRF uh, and we are all ready, we are all uh, you know good to go and start the um, uh, overlay configuration right. Um, I would recommend you to check the rest of the videos of the series right before this to get more clarity on what we are doing there right. Cool, let's proceed. And okay, so the last part in this video is the uh, lisp part which is very interesting. let me go back to my whiteboard uh, let me try to simplify as much as possible because the whole intention of this video is not to talk about lisp right it's to show you how to configure it uh, I'll, I'm planning to do a detailed lisp series as well after this so probably you can check it, check it out then but uh, let's try to condense this as much as possible so uh, we've got um, <clears throat> we've got our amazing fabric edges sitting here right these are our fabric um, edge devices, F, E, and then we've got uh, one of our uh, control node, control plus border, whatever, right? So in Lisp, right, uh, again, uh, what are we doing? We are, let's not, our game plan is to uh, connect, right, to, to do the networking part in a campus network. So what do we have right now? Say we have uh, clients coming in over here, right? So we have an IT client, uh, I don't know, this is the VLAN 10, right? So this is the fabric edge. As soon as uh, uh, the user, the IT user, let's say IT admin or someone, right, comes in, he gets assigned the VLAN 10 and, uh, you know, there's probably an IP address going to be assigned as well, 172.16.10.10, probably 10, right, an IP address got assigned and, you know, inside this device, we also have the VRF. So, uh, this uh, VLAN uh, 10, which is here, right, has been mapped or uh, uh, it's, it's connected to nothing but the VRF, right, which is, it's part of the VRF, which is, again, uh, VRF uh, IT, right? It gets put in the VRF. Now, similarly, you know, this would this fun this is going to happen on all the edges, other edges as well. And in the underlay, remember we have the cool. Uh, give me a, let me use a different color. In the underlay, we have the ISS running, which is connecting all the edges over here, right? Now, Lisp um, um, Lisp is basically used, or uh, you know, we we've got the underlay covered. Now we have to talk about the overlay, right? Because all these clients, they are coming and connecting all these different, uh, you know, fabric edges, right? So, how are we going to connect these guys, right? That is the next question, right? And what is our game plan here? So, <clears throat> we are going to connect them o via an overlay, right? So, again, uh, 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 Campus Fabric gives you flexibility to do L2 overlay as well, but that's something which we can't really do with this, with the setup which we have. Uh, with the CSRs because that's mainly a router, right? So we can do just a L3 overlay um, and uh, yeah, so L3 overlay. So when you talk about overlay, right, I'll not again speak much on overlay because, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's it's going to derail our conversation. So in overlay, we can, we are having two things, control plane, data plane, right? And in case of campus fabric control plane, we use Lisp, data plane, we use VXLAN, right? The why part, I'm not going to dig deeper. You can go and check out my SD access series or the overview where I have covered some of that. Uh, but, uh, you know, this is what it is. This is what we are using. We are using control plane, we are using Lisp. The data plane, we are using VXLAN. Remember, the signaling or the control plane for VXLAN can be anything. You can you don't even want a control plane. You can simply do flood and learn, put in some multicast. You can do ingress uh, replication, uh, you know, or you can do BGP, EVPN. They're different uh, varieties, right? So. The campus fabric which I'm explaining here uses control plane, uh, uses Lisp as a control plane, but you're not restricted to it. You can, if you uh, want to try something else, you can change this control plane to BGP, VPN, or probably, uh, you know, uh, use flood and learn as well, right? You don't even want especially a control plane itself, right? But Lisp has a lot of advantages, especially the whole location and identity separation, uh, you know, all of that, which again, I'll not drill into, like I said, uh, but uh, that is the reason why, you know, we are using this. So we've got these two things. And uh, again, another question which normally people get is, uh, you know, Lisp also can be used for data plane as well, right? So why not use the, why not use Lisp for data plane as well? Lisp control and Lisp data, right? 
uh, th there are there are some reasons for that as well you know the ethernet header is kind of um, you know the ethernet uh, 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 the ethernet section of the packet uh, during the encapsulation right uh, is kind of removed in case of lisp but in case of vxlan it is retained and that is why they use vxlan uh, and that's very much important once you do so I, again i'm not gonna uh, get much into that because that's a complete discussion let's come back to lisp right so in lisp some of the terms you need to know some of the important terms in lisp right uh, let me just uh, get rid of this for a minute so the terms which you really need to know because those are the terms we'll be using in our configuration as well so the fabric edges generally they they behave as uh, itr and uh, etr right and your control uh, this guy behaves as your uh, the control node border node whatever right it's going to work as uh, uh, map resolver and the map server right these are the four cool functionalities right which uh, which 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 uh, which which is like part of i mean this is literally the list terminology now uh, uh, what again um, you know what what each of these does you know it's again a huge discussion in itself let me try to condense so generally what happens is <clears throat> um, when a client comes in right or, or let's uh, roll back a little bit step number one right step number one we are having imagine we are having some clients over here right and in case of lisp uh, they, are, they are generally called as eids they are not called clients or they are not called routes they are called eids right endpoint ids right so what this guy does is this uh, etr right will take this eids and it will go and register to my map server over here right so etr is going to say hey look these are the clients which are connected to me these are the endpoints connected to me and is going to register same thing is done from by this guy as well as this guy right all the edges done step number one is done now comes the uh, data plane right oh sorry now comes the uh, now comes the data from these endpoints right what i mean by data is say this endpoint which is sitting here right wants to talk to some endpoint which is sitting here right so uh, that's when you know that the traffic comes into the fabric edge and that's when this guy is going to get uh, his job okay it is his job now so uh, that is why it's called as the itr right so the itr what he's going to do is he's going to send the map uh, resolution right so this is uh, it is it's going to send a map request to the map resolver right saying that hey i want to talk to this dude who is you know somewhere else you know in the campus fabric can you tell me where he is located right and that is when the control node will will uh, i mean it's not going to directly respond back it is actually going to forward that request to the actual fabric edge which has this guy because remember all the edges have registered the clients up to the to the map server right so this guy sitting here is kind of like the king he has all the information about all the eids you know throughout the fabric so anyone can request information from the you know map uh, from the control node right from the map server um, <clears throat> and uh, you know uh, the it's going to reply or it's going to help you with the information right so once once uh, you know this guy receives the information that hey this client is sitting behind uh, this uh, i don't know maybe fabric h3 right he is going to form a tunnel right and is going to send the traffic directly to him right getting the point so that's that's literally how your lisp works right again i've simplified this a lot um, but uh, yeah just just a quick understanding of that so that being said let's get back to configuring this guy in our topology so what we are going to do is uh, remember we have not done any configuration yet on the border and the control we will do that we even haven't even put the vrfs here so we'll do that but first let's go and wrap up the lisp configuration on all the three fabric edges right so let's do that so we are going to start with the the first fabric edge here right so let me get my notes ready um, so yeah let me try to make it as simple as possible but like i said you know um, uh, to understand the configurations completely you might uh, uh, you might need a little bit of further reading and that's why you know you, we've got this uh, config guide over here is a config guide did i close it yeah i think i closed it give me a second let me open it all right so this is a uh, config guide and uh, this has uh, detail about every single command right why do you use it what is the meaning of that command and so on right so yeah, if you want further reading you can check this out um, and uh, yeah let's get back to our first edge right so how do we get inside the lisp configuration you say router lisp and uh, locator uh, you need to you need to create um, you need to tell uh, 
so there's one thing which I kind of missed out telling here is that every edge which is here, right, every edge device which is sitting here is generally, uh, you know, kind of uh, has an identifier and that's called as the R lock, right? And this is the, this is very important in case of list because that is how everyone understands where an endpoint is sitting, right? So this map server will know that, you know, and let's use an IP address, right? Let's say 172.16.10.10, right? And let's say this R lock is 10.0.0.11, right? So this map server, which is sitting here, will record the information saying that, you know, when, when the registration happens, it's going to record the information saying that this 172.16, uh, 10.10 10, uh, IP is actually behind 10.0.0.11, right? So this R lock is very important, right? And this R lock is one that is identifying each of these fabric edges, right? So that's what we are configuring now. So we are basically telling uh, whenever you see the word locator, right? Whenever I configure locator, think of think of it as being something related to R lock, right? So the first thing is we need to tell um, you know, how is, uh, where, where we need to tell Lisp, right? How to reach these R locks, right? Is it in some VRF, right? In our case, no. Um, the R locks are nothing but the loopbacks which are in the global routing table. So we are gonna say default. Default is the global routing table, right? If it was in some VRF, we could have changed it. Like for example, let me show you, right? So we can put VRF and we can, you know, explicitly tell the VRF um, if it is part of a VRF. In our case, the R locks are nothing but the loopbacks and they are in the global routing data. Next, we need to create some kind of a locator set. Locator set is like, you know, BGP peer groups, right? So where you create um, uh, like a peer group and then use it, reuse it later in your configuration, right? Something like that. So in our case, let's create a peer group called edge one, site one, right? Because that's the name of this edge. So I'm going to give that only as the locator set. And I can give some properties here. So I'm going to say, what is the R lock IP address, right? It's nothing but the loop back zero, which I was talking about, right? So we are basically telling uh, our list that our R lock is loop back zero. We can put in some priority and uh, weight as well. I'm gonna go with like 10 and 10. Um, if there are multiple, you know, R locks, you know, that's how you can uh, prioritize them. Not something very important for our discussion. All right, so we are done with that. Now comes, let me uh, just, uh, ins instead of typing this, right, let me just drop the configuration from my notes uh, and spend my time you know, explaining it for you guys, right? So, um, so we are done with the, so now next is we need to tell, uh, we need to tell our list because again, in list you can have multiple such locators, right? You can have multiple R locks, right? Serving multiple list processes. So we are basically gonna tell my list, which is going to be my default locator set, right? So I'm gonna say, my default locator set is edge one, site one, which I just now configured over here, right? I'm just, you can make one of the locator set as your default, right? So that's done. Now, important thing is again, now let's go back to my config guide because I want to point out something here. And that's why I really like this config guide. Uh, where is that? I think it's somewhere here. Yeah, this section, this section is very important. Now, I had used Lisp actually a couple of years back, right? And uh, you know, back then the configurations were slightly different, right? Uh, because starting, I think, release 16.6.1, the CLI, you know, of Lisp has kind of changed, right? So you see things like, you know, service and, uh, uh, you know, slightly it's it's the, the model has slightly changed, right? So what they do in Lisp nowadays is this new, new as per this new uh, um, way of configuring, right? Uh, at the start of uh, the Lisp configuration, you put in all the default or uh, you you put certain configurations which are, which can then be used or inherited by, you know, the rest of the configurations, right? You get, you get it. So you put some general configuration at the top and then you can reuse it in your different instance IDs. So that's what we are going to do now. So let me just show you what we're going to do, right? So this is the general configurations on the top. And again, like I said, Lisp, um, we are basically doing L3 uh, overlay, right? But then um, Lisp also can be used to, uh, in fact, SD Access uses it to also create a L2 overlay, right? Now, we can't really create the L2 overlay. So that part of the section or in, in this case, you know, this bottom part doesn't really make sense for us. Uh, but, you know, a couple of commands are supported, not everything is support, supported, right? So uh, only this part is supported. 
but let's go through this quickly right so what we are telling is on this edge we are enabling the service ipv4 which is l3 lisp right and we are enabling encapsulation vxlan right so this is basically we are telling in the data plane please use vxlan don't use lisp rather use vxlan then we have um, remember we talked about this the maps uh, uh, resolver and the maps uh, server so we are configuring my fabric edge to be an itr right and we are configuring it to be etr as well a combination of both because we want both the functionalities right and in top of that we are also enabling we are telling my fabric edge who the map resolver and map server is right and you see in both the cases we are using 10.001 which is the control node right uh, loopback of the control node and uh, we've got the uh, uh, we also have some kind of a key over here right uh, which is uh, um, uh, it's basically for authentication similar to any routing protocol we are putting a key and we have to use the same key on the other side as well right so we have enabled the itr and etr functionality on my fabric uh, edge then we are also enabling sgt right and this is again a discussion which we are going to have in our policy plane disc, uh, policy plane video right uh, but we are enabling sgt because in case of uh, uh, campus fabric right the policy plane is taken care by trust side right? and we want the the traffic or we want the packet to carry the sgt um, you know inside the vxlan uh, you know uh, vxlan header right so we have to enable it over here if you don't enable it then that sgt will not be carried right cool so there are a few couple of optimization commands like you know a map cache away ead send map request this is mainly for um, you know, uh, uh, sending map request for the EIDs which have kind of moved away, right? When, again, whenever I, whenever you see EIDs, think of it as nothing but the endpoints, the clients. So if the endpoints have kind of moved away from my fabric edge to a different fabric edge, should you send a map request, right? Something to the around along those lines. Again, uh, there are some optimization commands which you know I'll not go deep into it. You can check out the config guide. The other important thing is uh, you might see what is this PETR, right? We did not talk about this. There's something called PETR and there's something called proxy ITR. So PETR is proxy ETR, proxy ITR. So these are two terminologies which kind of, which we kind of did not talk here, but they are very much needed when you want your Lisp domain to talk to a non-Lisp domain, right? So in this case, what happens is, uh, uh, you know, if you if you in our topology, if you see this guy is then connected to a Fusion router, right? So this guy doesn't run Lisp. This guy runs Lisp. So if you want uh, these guys to talk here, right? Uh, uh, I mean, if you want your, if you want the EIDs from inside to go outside, right? And and you want the traffic from outside to come inside, right? Then you need to configure um, what we call as the proxy ETR and the proxy ITR, right? Again, a huge, it's a, the reason and all of that, let me just get rid of this, getting too, uh, let me erase this as well. Give me a second. Yeah, so proxy ITR and ETR, right? It's very important uh, um, for when you want to, when you have something like this, right? You've got a control node here. You've got your fusion node here, right? And this guy is running Lisp and this guy is non, this is a non-Lisp space, right? So proxy ETR, generally you configure your, uh, uh, control node or the the whatever the border sorry the border is generally configured as the proxy etr the functionality of proxy etr is something like uh, this right when uh, and here you have all your fabric edges right this are your fabric edges so when the fabric edge or the client sitting here right generates some traffic which is not destined to any of the other you know which is not in internal traffic right if the traffic is destined to outside maybe internet Right, the traffic wants to go outside the internet then proxy etr is very important so this is like kind of like the default gateway of a lisp domain you can think of that way right so the fabric edge sitting here will will basically natively forward the traffic to the proxy etr to this guy and then the proxy etr you know can will decapsulate the traffic and send it down here and you know it goes out to the internet similarly in the other way around when the traffic from outside comes inside right so you need to configure this as a proxy ITR, right? Uh, that way, you know, the traffic which comes in the border node over here, right? Control and the border node over here will <clears throat> will capture all the traffic or will will think of think of this border node as a magnet now, right? Just like how a magnet attracts all the traffic. 
So similarly, when you configure this border node as a proxy ITR, it is going to kind of attract all the traffic which is destined to the Lisp domain, right? You know, all of the stuff below is a Lisp domain. So if there is any traffic which is destined to the Lisp domain, this proxy ITR will get activated and it will, it's going to absorb the traffic and then send it down to the Lisp domain, you know, uh, in a way which can be used. Again, I'm again super simplifying it, but yeah, that's very important, right? So that's the job here, right? You can see uh, <clears throat> uh, we are basically telling, uh, uh, we are basically telling our fabric edge to use my border node as the proxy ETR and uh, um, to use right and uh, there is another uh, there is another important thing um, which is uh, apart from these both guys acting as proxy ETR ITR the edges also is enabled to work as proxy ITR right and uh, again this this discussion we're probably going to have later when we talk about DHCP, right, how DHCP works uh, in Lisp. So for now, let's park this and clear, just uh, take my word on this, right, you have to enable proxy ITR on your, you know, edges as well. And that's why you see the IP address over here. This is nothing but my own IP address, right, of my own edge. So that's your IPv4 service. Service Ethernet is the L2 section, right, again, very much same as what we discussed above, right, only thing is you I mean, it doesn't make sense to put the proxy stuff here because, you know, it's a L2 traffic, right? Not L3 traffic, but, you know, we'll not be able to see this in the demo because we really, this service doesn't really work with the CSR 1000 Vs, right? So let's paste this quickly, right? And this is what we were talking till now. This is the, this is that common, you know, um, you know, configurations which we did. Let's just quickly see what we have done, right? So what we have done is, okay, the router is a bit slow. Okay, so this is what we have done, right? And whatever we have done till now, this is all the generic configurations. <clears throat> now we have to get down to the VRFs, right? So remember in Campus Fabric, whatever list we are using, we are using VRF our, you know, list, right? Because we have different VRFs. In our case, we have two VRFs. One is called sales and the other one is called as IT. So we have to enable Lisp inside the VRF as well, right? Otherwise, you will not get the connectivity and the routing inside the VRF, right? So to do that, and remember, apart from uh, the VRF, we also have the global routing table. And in the global routing table also we have, let me show you, show, do show IP route, right? See, in the global routing table, we have the subnet, right? The infra VLAN, right, uh, which we configured. This is the subnet where our access points are going to be connected in our fabric, right? So now in our case, right, uh, the next, uh, our next action should be to enable Lisp in all these three subnets, which is uh, 192.168.10.0, .10 which is in the global routing table, then two more, which is the, which is, uh, which are our uh, uh, VRFs, right? So let's start by this guy. Now to enable uh, the Lisp for each of these, uh, you know, routing tables, you have to use instance IDs. Instance ID is the way of doing that. So again, let me just drop the, this thing, otherwise it's gonna be, let's do that. So let's, uh, let me show you the instance ID, right? So this is how you configure the instance ID. So I'm just going with a, I'm just going with a random, uh, 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 I mean, the number can be anything, right? So I'm going with instance ID 3000, right? And you see here uh, uh, the dynamic EID. I've just uh, so dynamic EID is very much needed if uh, if you have your clients moving around, right? Uh, in this particular example, it probably doesn't make much sense because you know the access points you're not going to they're not going to be moving around the campus, right? So technically, I don't have to enable dynamic EID over here. I can do a static mapping, but you know anyway, let's uh, uh, it's it's not going to break anything. So let's continue, right? So. We've got the dynamic EID and you can give any name in our case. In my case, I'm given the name as infra, you know, VLAN. It's just that you have to use the same name later under the interfaces. So we need to make sure of that. I'll, I'll show you where to do that. Anyway, so we have enabled dynamic EID and the database. See, this is the subnet 192.168.10.0. So we are basically telling um, or the fabric edge or the, you know, XTR, right, will use this information um, when it is registering uh, to the uh, when it's registering the EIDs to the map server. So this is 
it is going to register EIDs from this particular subnet, right? And locator set, remember we talked about this locator set earlier, this is why, right? It's like a BGP peer group. We define the locator set at the top and we are reusing it throughout the configuration, right? And the service IPv4, right? So, the uh, it is the service IPv4 again is going to inherit all the service IPv4 configuration from the top, right? The generic configuration which we earlier configured and in addition to that it is also going to say that the EID table, right, the EID which is 192.168, this particular subnet is going to be part of the global routing table and not part of a VRF. And uh, map cache, this particular line is very important because uh, it is something to do with the, the proxy ITR, right. We Remember I told you we have enabled proxy ITR on this particular edge. So when you enable this proxy ITR, um, you know, this uh, the 0.0, .0 slash 0 entry, right, is not added. Uh, into the Ceph, right, uh, uh, or in the map cache, right, it's not added into the map cache uh, by default, right, so we need to explicitly add it, else your Lisp will not work. Again, it's a very much of a in-depth Lisp theory, so I'll not get into that. Uh, so that's mainly it, right, so this is how you enable uh, Lisp for that particular, you know, subnet in your global routing table. Now, remember, we have two more uh, subnets, don't we, right, so we've got uh, uh, my, let me just... Uh, grab that yeah so we've got two more guys one is our it right so i'm using a different instance id 4100 here and uh, you know everything is same as previous one uh, see here the subnet is different 172.16.10.0 locator set is same the vrf we are using the vrf it over here right that's very important we are basically telling this eid subnet 172.16 uh, is a subnet which the it clients are going to be used and they are basically part of the it vrf so that's why we are using that the rest of the stuff is same right uh, the only difference between this and the previous one is the vrf right because this is this instance id serves the vrf it okay that's done and the last guy is obviously our uh, the sales department right so let's do a, do that guy there you go so the sales is done very similar to previous one only the difference was we changed uh, uh, we changed the subnet right which is 192.20 i mean 172.16.20.0 and uh, the VRF became sales, right? And then there are probably just a couple of commands um, around uh, some housekeeping, something like uh, uh, we are basically telling uh, our locator, right? Uh, R locks, uh, I mean, uh, uh, the R locks need to have a minimum, you know, subnet mask of slash 32, right? In our case, our R locks are nothing but your loopback zero. So, you know, they are, and all of them are having slash 32. Um, and we are also telling when the uh, all this uh, when the Lisp messages on the Lisp uh, tunnel is uh, uh, created, please source it from loopback zero, right? Again, some how, uh, housekeeping commands. That's it. So now let's quickly look at what we have configured completely. Show run section uh, Lisp, right? Let's see what we have done. This is the end-to-end -end complete Lisp configuration that has to go inside the fabric edges. And this is directly taken from our uh, config guide here, right? Nothing different, right? Everything is over here. In fact, you scroll down to the bottom. This is exactly what we have done, right? So it's freely available out there. Nothing, uh, uh, I mean, I've not cooked anything over here, right? It's completely out there. I've just reusing it. All right, so this is, uh, again, just to summarize, this is your generic configuration at the top, right? Your service IPv4, service ethernet, and all of that. And then your instance IDs are uh, starting here. And the instance IDs have enabled just service IPv4, right? For each of the instance ID. The first instance ID is serving the subnet which is in the global routing table, which is the AP VLAN or the infra VLAN. Whereas the rest of the two instance IDs are serving the uh, VRFs, right? And, uh, you know, they are also, wherever I have enabled service IPv4, it is inheriting the IPv4 configuration from the top, right? In addition to that, it is also defining the VRF. So that's why I kept on saying, right? Whatever you do on the top, it is like the generic configuration right it gets inherited down and gets reused all right then let's do one more small stuff here so what we have done right now is we have enabled or we have enabled lisp but we also need to go and enable it under your uh, uh, under the interfaces right so let's uh, quickly probably do that so in our case give me a second all right so what are our interfaces in our case let's go back to our diagram right so where's our diagram here so, 
our interfaces are this gigabit 2 inside this gigabit 2 remember uh, at the start of the video we did the whole uh, you know creating the bridge bridge domains right the bridge domain interface bdi right so we are basically because our bdi is nothing but our default gateways or it's uh, any cast gateways um, you know um, in our in our setup right normally you would basically whatever i'm doing right now you would in your traditional network you would do it in a svi we have talked about this before i'm basically going to enable lisp on our bridge domain interfaces because that is the interface on which i'm getting my client traffic so let's go and check our bridge domain let me clear the screen a bit so, okay so show run interface bridge domain interface 10 i guess is it 10 yeah 10 uh, 20 and 30 right we have got these three guys so we need to enable lisp on these interfaces because these are the interfaces where we get the traffic so how do you do that so let me show you on one of them so you go inside the uh, bridge domain interface right uh, we say lisp mobility right uh, because uh, we can actually disable this liveness check which is generally enabled by default so let's disable that that's kind of like uh, it keeps on checking if the client is still there and all of that it's basically uh, some housekeeping stuff not very relevant to our discussion uh, but we have to enable lisp mobility now because that is very much important it goes hand in hand with whatever we have configured here right Do you, uh, remember we have configured this dynamic eid and the database mapping <clears throat> by doing this we are basically telling lisp that our clients are have a possibility of moving around the campus right so we are enabling dynamic um, eids right so uh, now we are enabling we need to enable list mobility under the interface and this has to match uh, what has to match uh, interface bdi 10 is serving our it users right so let's go and check what is the dynamic eid for our it folks this is the one right it ipv4 right so let's go and uh, grab that and put it here that's it right similarly um, change this to bdi 20 enable or disable sorry disable the liveness check and lisp mobility but this time use the sales uh, where is our let's look at the configuration here on the top yeah here you go the sales dynamic id right so we are attaching this uh, interface to the lisp uh, process by doing this way and the last guy is um, BDI 30. Now this guy really doesn't need mobility because it's the AP VLAN, but still let's go and you know enable. It's not gonna break anything. So what is the AP guy? Uh, I think it's somewhere on the top. Probably yeah. Here you go. Infra VLAN. We are calling it as Infra VLAN. So let's go and put it there. And uh, yeah, that's it, right? So let's look if our interfaces are up. Uh, show IP interface brief. Yeah, all the BDIs are up, right? So that's it guys that's literally how you enable uh router lisp right you have enabled lisp and vxlan in the you know overlay and we have enabled it on the interfaces now i'm going to pause the video and go back and do the same thing quickly on the rest of the two edges as well and then i'll be back all right so we are done with the uh, uh edges right we have configured the fabric edges and all the three i've configured all the three with whatever i showed you earlier you can see the bridge domains and uh, you know all the uh, all the lisp related stuff is done on the bridge so this is sorry on the edge that was edge one this is edge two and we also have the third guy which is our edge uh, three over here right so this looks good okay so the next thing is let's move on to our border node right we haven't done much on the border node or border and control plane node right so let's do that let me just reconnect to this guy. Give me a second. Yeah, good. It's back. So uh, the first thing is let's check if we have the VRFs on this guy. Do we have it? I uh, suspect it's not configured. So we will have to do that first. Okay, so it's not there. So let's configure the VRFs. The same VRFs which we did on the edges, right? Very same because we want the we want the traffic isolation and uh, uh, we want the security everything throughout the campus so we are gonna enable the same vrfs over here right you can see here sales and it and i have also defined the route targets right i'm using the same numbers which i am using everywhere uh, 4100 for uh, it right the route uh, target export and import the route distinguisher 
and uh, 4101 for uh, the sales. So let's put that. Right. So done with the route targets. Now the next thing is uh, obviously here we don't have the whole. I mean at least till now we don't have the whole bridge domain uh, and all of that. Right. That was only on the edges side because that's where the traffic is coming from. Different, uh, you know, subnets and different. I mean different clients and all of that. Uh, your border and the control plane node just acts as a map server and map resolver. So the Lisp configuration here is going to be slightly different from what we did on the fabric edges. So let's look at that. Let's start with the, the first part, which is um, router Lisp, the locate, locator table, right? Where we are telling how how this guy can reach the uh, um, R locks, right? We are telling you can reach it via the default uh, routing table. And then you've got given a name to the locator set and the locator set information. Right, very similar to what we did. Right, remember locator set is like BGP peer group. Now the next uh, stuff is relating to the services. Right, the generic configuration which we were talking about earlier. So we have the service IPv4 and the uh, service Ethernet. Right, observe here carefully. We have uh, enabled ITR. We have enabled ETR. Uh, we have enabled SGT. We have enabled uh, proxy ETR. Right, remember I told the border node acts as a proxy ETR because all the traffic which is destined to uh, outside the fabric it has to go to the border node right so you have the proxy etr and you also configure this device to be the proxy itr as well right because for the return traffic right i don't know if my diagram is still here probably here yeah all the traffic which comes from outside right it has to get captured so that's why we need to make this guy proxy itr as well so that's why you make it proxy itr then you also enable two more functionalities which is map server and map resolver right map server is basically think of it as that construct which stores all the EID uh, to our lock mappings and map resolver is the one which is going to always uh, reply back to you uh, or is going to <clears throat> whenever you send a uh, request right asking hey uh, uh, hey um, you know uh, control node can you tell me where this particular client is connected right so that is that is the job of this guy so he can reply back he can give you information um, to your queries and similar with the uh, service ethernet as well but uh, like i said service ethernet uh, is uh, uh, we are not going to activate l2 overlay here because you know uh, because it's a csr 1000v it doesn't really support it uh, a few commands are supported so i just wanted to put it here you know uh, but technically even if you don't configure this it will st i mean whatever we are doing it is not going to have any impact right great so let's go and finish that All right so that's done now remember the instance ID configuration that is important start with the first instance ID which is instance ID 3000 right so that is how uh, so again what we are doing right now we are doing configuration on the broader control plane which is nothing but the map server and resolver right so instance ID 3000 maps to the instance ID 3000 which we have configured on the fabric edges right so uh, <clears throat> we are basically uh, configuring a bunch of things like uh, for example, distance uh, site registration 250 is nothing but the administrative distance, right? At the end of the day, Lisp is a routing protocol, right? So you need to have some admin distance. So this is how you configure the admin distance. Uh, route export site registration is needed because later we will be redistributing this Lisp into BGP, right? So we have to enable that. And observe the EID table is default. We have talked about this before. Uh, map cache uh, site registration. So this is uh, again, uh, 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 you would have already seen me doing a command in the previous uh, when we did it on the edges we did map cache and we put 0.0, .0 right so similar to that we are doing map cache site registrations and i'll sh show you the actual importance of this in a minute when we go to the end of the configuration right so again if you don't understand some of the commands here because you need to have a good hold on your list to get all of this so i totally understand if some of the things are not clear with which case you can go back to the config guide because I've done everything from the config guide only you can you'll be able to, you'll be able to figure out uh, you know what each of these commands kind of actually mean right since we can't cover everything here so the next is the instance ID 4100 which is referring to the VRF IT right and um, we are enabling the same thing right we are basically making this uh, device as the map server and resolver for this instance ID as well so it is going to inherit everything from the top right for service IPv4 in addition to that this is the extra configuration which we saw earlier right very similar to that right so we are done with the instance id 4100 and the other instance id is 4101 which is my uh, vrf sales right the sales so very similar to that let's wrap that up okay
So once that is done, the other extra piece which comes in your map server is you need to have a site uh, defined, right? Site uh, is basically, uh, think of it as uh, like a domain, like a Lisp domain kind of a thing. So on the map server and resolver, you generally define a site, right? Uh, you can give any name to the site and uh, <clears throat> there are some important configurations which go here. So this is a site which I have defined on my, this configuration, the site configuration is not done on the fabric edges. Okay, let me repeat, repeat that again. It is it happens only on the uh, borders or I mean our control nodes, right? Which is our map server and resolver. Authentication key is Cisco. Remember we used the same key over there on the uh, fabric edges. So we need to use the same thing here as well. These are the three important lines here, right? EID record instance ID 3000, 4100, 4101 and you are basically explicitly telling which is the subnet from where you know the clients are going to register our clients are going to be registered right so we are telling instance id 3000 is going to register this particular subnet whereas instance id 4100 which is what i think it is going to register for this one and this is the sales subnet which is this right and this is very important accept more prefix uh, accept more specifics if you don't put this piece um, your um, what will not work your uh, 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 the mobility will not work right your uh, database mapping uh, uh, all the dynamic EID, whatever we have defined, right? That won't work, right? So that's important, right? So let's paste that, right? And uh, remember, I told about this map cache registrations here on the top. I told I'll just talk about it later. I think this command map cache registration that the, for that command to work, right? This is very much important. So now it is basically going to create, um, you know, this again, uh, you need to know a little bit of list for that. But uh, in the map cache, so Lisp has two tables. One is your database table, other one is your map cache table, right? So the database table keeps, uh, um, uh, let me just write it down here in case you know, if anyone is interested, right? There are two tables. Lisp has two tables. One is your database table, right? And the other one is called as your map cache table. These are two important tables, especially for all your troubleshooting and stuff. Database table stores uh, locally connected uh, EIDs, right? Whereas map cache table basically is nothing but the forwarding uh, uh, data plane, uh, forwarding table, right? This is the forwarding, uh, think of it as like a fib for, you know, forwarding information base, just like your fib, right? This is your forwarding uh, table for your Lisp, right? So whenever Lisp has to, um, whenever Lisp gets a packet, uh, uh, the router running Lisp, right, or Fabric Edge gets a packet, it will first check its, um, you know, uh, I mean, uh, for the Lisp uh, forwarding, it will always use this table to forward uh, the packets, right? Um, <clears throat> so, uh, now, uh, what are we doing here is, uh, you know, with the with the map cache registration, map cache, what is that, site registration, we are basically creating an entry for each of these three prefixes. Um, uh, in that particular uh, table. All right. So yeah, uh, that's mainly that's okay. The other last part I think I probably missed is the generic. Uh, uh, basically, uh, we are basically telling the IPv4 R lock, right? Reachability exclude default, right? So what what this command really does is uh, we are telling uh, if the R lock, which is nothing but uh, R locks, we have already talked about this is nothing but the um, loopbacks, right? Loopbacks of all my fabric edges. So if the R lock is reachable via a default route, then, you know, exclude that particular R lock, right? Or basically, uh, basically tell that that particular R lock is not reachable and don't do anything with that particular R lock or don't talk to that R lock, right? So that is the reason for this. Again, uh, it's probably not going to have a major impact in our topology here, but you know, you have flexibility for doing that, right? In our case, uh, and then obviously the source is loopback zero, right? So in our case, you see, obviously our, uh, if I do those show IP route, right, our uh, R locks are all reachable uh, without a default route. They are all reachable via ISS, right? You have specific routes here, see? So these are our R locks, right? This is R lock one, this is R lock two and R lock three. And in our case, all the R locks are reachable directly with and not through uh, a default route. So in our case, it's not going to have much of an impact, but yeah, that's good to have as well, cool. So it looks like we have configured everything on the border node. Uh, so let's see what we do next. All right. So coming back to our, uh, you know, plan, right? We are talking about the overlay. We have configured the Lisp and VXLAN. Everything is done. 
we have done the macro segmentation which is creating the virtual networks which is sales and IT and obviously in the global routing table we have created in intra VN and uh, we have in the overlay we have created the Lisp and VXL and everything is done. So time to verify whatever we have done right. So our objective here is to see uh, intra VN communication. Intra VN is basically to check if IT host 1 is able to talk to IT host 3 or sales host should be able to talk to one more sales host right that's what we want to do. So before that uh, let's check if some of our uh, uh, you know Lisp stuff is working properly right. So let's check some of the show commands and uh, some troubleshooting show commands and uh, let's uh, uh, let's do that. So let's go down to my uh, or let's actually uh, send the traffic right. Uh, let's do some captures as well let's do that let me pause the video and grab some captures. All right, so uh, just remember, so we've got uh, or let me just uh, write down the IP addresses so that it's easier for us to test all this, right? So let's go down here. So what do we have? Okay, so yeah, this is going to be, um, you know, the subnet for my uh, IT is 170. Okay, so my pen is not writing as expected I think okay 172.16.10.10 right so that is going to be my uh, uh, IT host one and this one is going to be dot uh, 11 right uh, similarly uh, uh, your uh, uh, sales is going to be what sales is going to be um, it's going to be 170 uh, my pen is giving up on me my bad Maybe can I type it? Give me a second. All right. So I've just mentioned the IP addresses here so that it's easier for us to remember. 172 16.10.0 is IT host 1 and 10.11 is IT host 3. Whereas the other subnet which is 20.10 and 20.11 are our sales host, right? So let's go back here and uh, let's go to host IT host 1 which is here, right? So let's see, let me show you the configuration, show IP interface brief, uh, it has the IP address and uh, it also I have put a default gateway which is nothing but the um, uh, bridge domain interface, right? Because from our diagram if you see, what is the default gateway, let me just use this one, default gateway for our IT host is the, uh, is the bridge domain interface which we have configured here on the edge one, right? In fact, it's the Anycast gateway. The Anycast gateway is common across all the three devices. So, yeah. So that being said, uh, show IP route. Yeah, there you go. So 172.16.10.1. So first, let's check if we can ping this guy. So if you can ping the default gateway. Right? Yes. We can ping the default gateway, which looks good. Let's quickly check the other host as well. Show IP interface uh, brief. And this guy should be able to ping the default gateway here. So that's your, okay, host 2 looks good. Let's check host 3, which is the other guy. Uh, it should be ping 172.16.10.1. <clears throat> and this guy is actually, what is this IP address? It is 10.11, right? And the last one is uh, the sales 4. Uh, my bad. Okay, so it's uh, ping and it's 20.1 if I'm not wrong. That's the default gateway for that particular subnet. So there you go. Show IP interface brief. All right, that looks good. Sweet. So we are able to ping our default gateways, right, which is from here to the default gateways. So all of that is good. So now let's check a little bit on the Lisp side, right. So uh, what is happening? Let me actually, so I have created, uh, I have uh, packet captures going in at, uh, you know, all these three interfaces, which are the interfaces here, right? This one, let me use that, right? So this guy, uh, this one and this one. So all these three interfaces, I have packet captures happening, right? So let's grab and see what is happening. Probably let's pick this guy first. So where is he? I think it is this one. Yeah, there you go. So that's my packet capture for that particular interface. And you can see there is some Lisp stuff already happening on the top. Here you go, right? So you have the Lisp, Lisp uh, registrations and all of that because we just now generated some traffic, right? We sent 
we sent uh, some traffic up uh, 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 we sent some traffic to a default gateway as a result you can see there is some registration and all of that which is already started you can see the registration here right you can see the lisp information being carried uh, you can see the 172.16.20.10 which is nothing but our EIDs right so you can see all the registration is happening which is a good thing now uh, what we'll do is just push this on the other side uh, let's lo look at like I said let's look at some of the lisp related commands right so let's go to probably fabric edge one let's go to fabric edge one which is here right and let's look at show lisp session uh, my bad let's clear the screen a bit okay so let's look at show lisp uh, session and there you go you can see the session is there you can see there's a session with the uh, with the control node right you can see it is up right and uh, all of the information looks good to me now let's look at some stuff so we can do show lisp uh, uh, we can uh, <clears throat> what is what are the other what are the various things which you can do here right so we can check uh, probably instance id because you know we have the vrf right uh, and what is the VR instance id 4100 for the id right we can check what is happening there we'll check in ipv4 uh, database right uh, database yeah there you go so you can see for um, it is basically telling us that this is a locally connected eid right so it is telling us that for instance id 4100 we have 172.16.10.10 which is nothing but my high t host one right it is telling that this guy is locally connected right so that's the information which it is giving us let's check for instance id 4101 what is happening it should have the other it should have the sales host right there you go this is the sales host awesome so <clears throat> uh let's also look at uh, i think probably the map cache table will be empty right now because we haven't done any forwarding yet right so if i do change this to map cache uh, uh, and if you do enter see uh, you don't have much information uh, you just have this default entry right uh, uh, this entry is very important because without this entry uh, my edge device will not send a map request uh, for any unknown EIDs, right? So this entry is very important. If you don't see this, then there's something wrong which you have done with your configuration, right? So similarly for which was that EID? Uh, I mean, which was that? We'll just change the instance ID to 1400 as well. Yeah, there you go. So this is the map cache table. What we saw on the top, this was the database table which is showing the locally connected EIDs, whereas this is the map cache table which is the literally the forwarding table of your Lisp okay what else i mean uh, there are these are like two important commands which i normally personally use uh, apart from that probably you can also check show lisp uh, service i guess is that is that a command yeah service uh, ipv4 summary does it give something yeah so this gives some information as well right oh we checked two instance ids we probably did not check the other instance id which is our global routing table right which is uh, again 3000 we checked let's check that guy as well there you go so that is there and we can also check the database table for him right there you go no locally connected uh, that's because we did not generate any traffic yet for that guy right so remember we we went and just generated traffic for it host one and these guys but we did not do anything with the ap's right my ap's are also nothing but iol routers i have just simulated it like i've told before let's probably go and generate some traffic for the ap's as well there you go these are my ap's right uh, so what do they have show ip interface brief awesome so the default gateway here is 192.168.10.1 uh, right you can able to ping that let's do the same thing on the rest of the two ap's as well they are also in the same subnet obviously infra vlan right this is in the global routing table and last guy is here yeah so now that we have generated some traffic if you go back here and check the database table look we have the uh, so normally i mean it's not that uh, you really have to do ping uh, to uh, for the lisp to work in your regular network you will have some uh, garp right you will have some gratuitous uh, arp which is generated so any kind of traffic is enough for lisp to get activated and uh, to do its thing right so since i mean in, because our hosts are not really or our clients are not standard clients we are just simulating them that's why i need to generate some junk traffic you know so that uh, the lisp uh, gets activated